So basically, when I was uh, in high school, I don't, I think like first or second year, I bought, I remember a 3D Studio Max 2 book, and it was we're talking 1997 or something like that. And so I read it cover to cover, you know, without trying um, almost anything out in the software itself. And then since I kind of adopted this method of learning, you know, I read C++ primer cover to cover without doing anything, without writing code, just as a first step of learning thing. And then the rationale, rationale behind it was that. I want to know what's possible, so I want to know what can be done without caring too much about how to do it, you know. So that, and then the second step, I started some new project that I imagined I want to do, usually big one, not a small Hello World one. And then I would be able to create the structure in my head because I know what can be done, and then I would go back to the book just to see how. So those those are the times of the books, right? <laughs> then. So you're the you're the uh, you're the RTFM guy. <laughs> yeah. something like that that's good so basically on the on the same same lines you know i uh, i although i have been dealing with this cloud thing a, a bit i feel still like I, i'm a beginner here and uh, because it's not so far from the truth that i i, I will be a, a dummy in this conversation and second because i want to go through the basics so that i can understand them and hopefully people in their homes can understand them uh, watching this so this what, what is this this is of course rhino compute and cloud computing what we're talking about and uh, the way i imagined uh, starting is that is when when i go to the rhino compute web page it says there on the bottom compute is based on the rhino inside technology so maybe you could give me like a short explanation of the connection between rhino inside and rhino compute is like one the subset of the other or a successor or or how do two of them fit together okay um, I guess I'll start. Uh, so my name is Steve Bear, <laughs> and um, I I type a lot of code on Rhino, <laughs> and uh, so I, I think you guys know who I am. I mean, yeah. I, I've talked to you a lot before in the past. Yeah. I know I know Luis and Will know who I am, <laughs> <laughs> and I've talked to you in the past, Milo. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Of course. Um, uh, so Rhino inside is. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to do when we came up with Rhino 6 was not break our SDK. So this is a long, this is a long background here, but mm -hmm. I want to kind of like, one of the things that we want to keep as we keep releasing new and newer versions of Rhino is to allow old plugins to continue to work in them. Um, because if old plugins don't work, then, um, well, people don't upgrade. <laughs> yeah. Right. People, yeah. I mean, some plugin developers go away; they get bought by other companies. Um, it's just, it's just, a, it's just a bit of a headache. Yeah. Um, with respect to .NET, it's not that big of a deal. We know how to to work around that with .NET based plugins, but C plus plus plugins, it does become a problem um, if we break our SDK. Mm -hmm. um, so what what I did in V six was um, essentially I knew that I wanted to get to this point, and in V six. Um, I took all of Rhino, I mean, the entire application and um, made it into a, what is called a DLL or a dynamic, dynamic link library on Windows. Um, and there's basically a small stub app called rhino.exe, which is probably 100 lines of code, maybe 200 lines of code that just starts up the DLL and um, launches it as Rhino. Mm -hmm. um, what that allowed us, and, and so in Rhino 6, we didn't really, we basically left it at that. We, there's, you know, you couldn't really launch Rhino in any other way. Um, but we knew that we needed to do this because if we didn't make a DLL out of Rhino um, at this point, and, and during Rhino 6, and we did make a DLL out of Rhino in Rhino 7, we would break our, our C++ SDK and um, no plugins would work between 6 and 7. So we were like, all right, let's just do that. That's all, that, that's all we want to do because it's the big project. Um, and so in Rhino 7, we started actually uh, doing development on what we call Rhino Inside. And, and that's basically just um, Rhino running as a DLL inside of some other process. Mm -hmm. um, and since the, 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 the vast majority of Rhino is, is just a DLL now, mm -hmm. um, we, can launch, we, can, we can load it inside of, of other EXEs. Um, you yeah. know, and we have samples out there, like you can make your own, um, standalone console application in C sharp, mm -hmm. load Rhino into it and have it do something 
that you want to do special, mm -hmm. you can load it into, uh, we have samples for C, running it, C Python. Python's another executable. So you just load Rhino into that executable. It has to be a 64-bit version, mm -hmm. um, but you load Rhino into it. So Rhino is running as a DLL inside of Python. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other big one that um, you know we, we're, we're very proud of is, is Revit. Uh, so we're running, uh, we're doing a lot of work running Rhino and so, as a as basically the largest plugin I can imagine for Revit yeah. <laughs> is what Rhino is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and what does that do for Revit is that actually allows you to, um, since you're in the same process, you could write custom code that takes advantage of both the Revit APIs and the Rhino Common APIs at the same mm -hmm. time. Instead mm -hmm. of instead of doing some, I mean, people work around this by doing some like fancy networking, basically. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and it works, mm -hmm. except you don't have a full, you, you have to write a full API on each, each side. Yeah. Um, and how does that then uh, transform into Rhino Compute? So Rhino Compute is, is just, just another form of Rhino inside. So Rhino is a DLL mm -hmm. and Rhino Compute is a pretty small um, EXE that is uh, running as a .NET web server. Um, I hate to use the term web server, but really it's, it, it is, I mean, it's, it's really a service that other web servers should talk to, but it's, it's, it's a, it's, it's a EXE that launches Rhino um, and, and, and also opens a, a port and listens to it for um, HTTP, mm -hmm. HTTPS uh, type traffic. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, and, and for, when it's requested, it, it gets yeah. it. It solves and gives an answer. Mm -hmm. And for example, for me, I mean, when I use Rhino Common and, and write a plugin to C Sharp, what is the difference between then and Rhino Compute in, in the sense of what is available in Rhino Compute for me that's uh, what is not available in Rhino Compute that it is in Rhino Common and vice versa? And, and is that changing? Okay. Um, so, first off, what's not available is, is user interface. I think that's. Yep. To some people, that's pretty obvious, but others, it's not. Um, and so we're not writing a version of, of uh, Rhino that runs with full user interface in the cloud. It's, yep. This is not, <laughs> that's not what we're working on. <laughs> we're, we're working on a geometry calculator, right? So, um, so basically anything that has to do with user interface, like layers, nodes, whatever it Right. You wouldn't, you wouldn't expect, so you shouldn't expect to, to get um, some sort of viewport that you could pick with the, on with your mouse yeah, yeah. and move geometry around and all that kind of, um, mm -hmm. or toolbars or any of that kind of stuff, actually. Yeah. So it's about geometrical calculations, right? About geometrical calculations. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, we would like to support um, uh, running some OpenGL on, on, on this uh, situation for doing view captures, but we're not there yet either. Mm -hmm. um, our okay. OpenGL code is is currently structured in a way that it it thinks that a window must always exist. Mm -hmm. and, and when you're running Rhino compute, it's, it's running in what we call a headless mode. It's basically just a, a library mode. Yeah. Um, and there is no user interface. So we need to restructure our OpenGL code to, and you can do it. We just need to restructure it so that it can do things like view captures. Okay. And, and help me understand. Sorry. Yeah. Milos, I was going to say for, you mentioned, you know, what does it give you as a developer, um, Rhino Compute versus, you know, Rhino Common. I mean, as a developer, I think one thing that's important is that a lot of what you do, um, you can still use. Uh, you can actually write plugins for Compute. I mean, this is kind of a, a deeper subject, but in the same way you'd write a plugin for Rhino, you can write a plugin for Rhino in mm -hmm. the same way, have that be uh, in the same place to where Rhino is, is uh, running, um, and also expose it as an endpoint to Compute. Uh, if you are good with Grasshopper definitions or making Grasshopper add-ons, you can still make those, mm -hmm. install them into the into the server where where Rhino is running, and and you know you can access them through Rhino Compute from other devices where Rhino wouldn't be running. So as a developer, mm -hmm. um, you can still use a lot of the same tools and a lot of the know-how that uh, that you're already uh, deploying for desktop Rhino. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just going to put that somewhere else in the cloud. Yeah, yeah, that's a that, that's a really good point. Like. We're just trying to make compute work for developers right now. It's a developer tool. Yeah, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. we're not we're not making a. We do have a prototype website that we just always kind of kick ourselves why we even have it there, but mm -hmm. we need to have something. 
but our full expectation is is it's you're supposed to like bring up your own server your own compute server mm -hmm. you install your own custom plugins um that you've written or maybe someone else has written um to run on that instance and yeah. um, you're in full you're in full control that's one of the actually basic very basic questions that i wanted to to ask you uh the, the server itself i mean the, tu the tutorials the, those basic ones that are set up on the web uh, I think they're calling the functions over API from your McNeil cloud server, right? So, but the idea is somehow that we can set it up on our own server, grind the compute, and not use yours, right? So that's, f yeah, from the first question, if that's possible, and apparently it is, and I guess it's advisable, right? Not only is, yeah, not only is it possible, that's what we absolutely want you to do. Yeah. Um, we don't want to be responsible. <laughs> we don't, when, our, when our web server goes down, we're not installing new plugins well, on it. Our web server does <laughs> go down too. So, um, and yeah. then we forget, and then someone tells us that it's down. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, yeah, and, and, and we all, I mean, we just had to structure our, our samples that way because, um, mm -hmm. I mean, Will can, Will can elaborate on this, but until recently, it was actually pretty hard to get a, a web server set up with compute running on it. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just kind of wanted to showcase what what you can possibly do without adding that extra hurdle of, of setting up your own web server, which is tough. Mm -hmm. It was tough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I can talk a bit about yeah. the um, uh, the kind of tech, uh, I guess the technical side to to to, to setting up a, a web server and, yeah. and 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 what's required. Um, the I guess the heart of it and the thing that that trips up. Um, a lot of people is uh, Rhino. At least, at least uh, this this Rhino is a, is still a Windows desktop application, um, and so it still requires a a desktop. Um, I shouldn't say desktop operating system, but it requires a, a like a fully fledged uh, version of of Windows. Yeah. Um, so we get a lot of questions. Well, you know. Can I run it on Linux, or can I run it in some like the really lightweight uh, Windows Docker containers? Yeah. And the answer to both of those is unfortunately no. Um, the the easiest way to run it is to to spin up a virtual machine or a um, or a physical a physical server with with Windows Server. I recommend Windows Server 2019, um, just because it's the latest and, and, and greatest. Um, and then we have we've written scripts that will basically walk you through the process mm -hmm. of um, making sure that the the firewall is configured properly, um, so the the, the server is able to uh, to to get out to the internet and back. Mm -hmm. um, uh, make sure you get your license set up properly, and we've we've done a lot of work. Um, to our licensing mechanisms to come up with a a system where you can you can set up the whole license just by setting a a single environment variable, okay. which makes things very simple for uh, for setting up a um, uh, something in a in a server environment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the script walks you through through everything, walks you through setting up a um, uh, securing your uh, your instance of compute with a uh, an API key, mm -hmm. so it's something that will be be known by both the the server and anything that you have that's going to be calling it. And it's a very simple um, method of of um, security, but it's let, it's it's a good place to start. Let, let me ask you. I mean, this uh, this authentication that you have now on this example, very simple example on the internet. It's uh, uh, is is the same type of authentication used uh, or the same method when I set up my own server as in this example when I'm calling your server, or is, is there some significant difference there? It's it's slightly different. Um, so with our server, what we what we did, and bear in mind this was um, going back a little over two years ago now. Uh, when we set up our server, we put Rhino accounts authentication in front of it. Um, we we thought um, we were still exploring what this would be, whether it be something a project that we were going to take on, or whether it was going to be a project that we'd have other people 
um, you know, host their own and thought to start with, let's create a free server. Um, let's let's get um, let's uh, say force. Let's require people to use uh, Rhino accounts to authenticate when they're making calls. Yeah. And what that allows us to do is to um, you know see where where the calls are coming from. See um, you know who's who's using it a lot, who's using it a little, uh, which companies are using it, and just helps us get an idea for um, you know who's using it what they're using yeah. um and you know where they're from so we know who who, who to talk to so so that that, yeah. that that was why we set it up with with rhino accounts mm -hmm. um and then um when we when we realized that really this is something more that we want other people to host themselves um we added a different um uh we came up with a different authentication um authorization method mm -hmm. Um, which is just this simple API key. Um, it's this token, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's it's you know uh, like very very common to be sending um, API keys, mm -hmm. um, authentication tokens in mm -hmm. in um, request headers. So it's just something 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 very very simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, because uh, I noticed that, be, I, again, I'm coming uh, to this cloud story as a relative beginner. And then I noticed when I tried the example, in the example, you have Scott's email, right? So I thought, okay, this goes over email authentication. I tried different things, didn't work. Then I found out I have to go to compute login and generate this token. And then I did that and then it worked. That means uh, that if, if I did set up on my own ser with my own server, it would kind of go with uh, using this authentication token right do, do you have right that, i mean that's that's the, that's the that's the idea i mean you don't have to have one either you, you don't even yeah. have to have a token it's yeah, it's yeah. just that we made up some way to for you to feel somewhat safe about your calls yeah, but of course, of course. um since you would be the only client you only need mm -hmm. one token and where where our server we set up we basically wanted to have be able to uniquely identify people and pay someone of usage or something like that right we could turn okay. someone off just before I move on from this uh, server story, just uh, do you have something like a getting started tutorial or something like that, where if I say want to set up something on AWS or something like that, how I would approach it or no, not yet? I was going to say, Luis and I did a, a workshop very, very recently, um, building on top of the workshop that, um, that, that Steve did, um, I think June, June or July. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in both of those, um, so, so the video from Luis and I's workshop will be available soon. That was at AEC Tech, uh -huh. um, yeah. and we go through the process of of setting it up on on AWS. And and actually, if you go to the the GitHub repository, um, there's there's a document there um, called I think Deploying Rhino Compute, and and it goes through the process of um, setting up the licensing because you have to have a special um licensing works a little bit differently for compute you use something called core hour billing uh -huh. um so instead of having a using seat based um licensing the same you know license you use when you um when you start rhino up on your on your personal computer uh we we came up with a different kind different way of of, of licensing um, uh, Rhino when it's running in a server environment. Um, so we charge 10 cents per core per hour. So if you're running it for one hour on a machine with, with two, um, uh, two CPU cores, two, I should say two virtual CPU cores, um, then it'll, I, I shouldn't have forced myself to do math, but <laughs> it'll be 10 cents by two, um, by two cores. You can do by it. <laughs> What's okay. that? 20 cents. 20 cents. There we go. That's right. There's a reason I write software. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll, I'll be sure to check out uh, the video uh, the, the moment it comes out because I'm playing with that. And uh, so let's move on from server. And uh, I want to ask something about our... I think I have my video somewhere. I mean, basically, it's just...
Are you are you talking about the one where you use the Heroku and Node.js and the, uh, yeah okay I saw I, I I was looking at that one and actually that's my starting point for for the question about language because in that video you use the um, JavaScript and the JavaScript library and the Heroku and so on and so on of course that's not uh, uh, what I prefer I mean even though I have most experience in C plus plus I'm using mostly C sharp nowadays. So let's say C sharp is my favorite at the moment. So, so naively said, you know, we have this back end and front end. So the thought process goes, if I'm using C sharp, should I do everything in C sharp? Like uh, set up my server, uh, use AS, ASP.NET uh, and use Rhino, uh, Rhino compute in C sharp and so on. And then I, th uh, I think about the projects that we are working on now that involve platforms and we are actually using Python a lot in the back end. We're using Django, we're hoping to connect it to TensorFlow because that's at the moment the best AI library and so on. So in, from that point of view, I'm thinking, okay, maybe I should use the Rhino Compute Python library and uh, speaking about the back end for now. So I, I wonder if you see if there are limitations to using the Rhino Compute based on the uh, choice of language. Like if I choose to go to approach it over JavaScript or Python or C sharp in any way, or it's just is it just uh, how how uh, the comfort I uh, I have with them? Well, I guess um, I mean there's two there's two what I would call backend pieces here. There's compute itself, which yeah. is running Rhino Rhino in in, in this process, um, and you could rewrite that that web server too. Um, I mean, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a pretty simplistic uh, C sharp uh, web server um, that probably does a lot more than what you may really need. Mm -hmm. um, you could just you could use you could use C Python and use Rhino inside C Python as a web server um, using what are, what are they what is it Flask now I guess is the hot one right? We're actually actually uh, we're using Flask mostly for for our platform. Yeah. You, you could you could you could use C Python and um, from C Python you could just call right into the Rhino core. I, we haven't done it, but I know I know it's going um, mm -hmm. <laughs> to work. Yeah. <laughs> but we, 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 we still we would have, have to have run to... it on an actual an actual Windows. That's server. correct. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. So even if you even if you write in Python. Um, yeah, it doesn't mean you can then run run your compute server in mm -hmm. inside of um, uh, Heroku or, or, or something like mm -hmm. that. Right, um, right. That Windows server has to be something that you can actually um, double click on the Rhino installer and get mm -hmm. Rhino installed on. So if I use, but if I decide to use uh, uh, Rhino compute Python version or JavaScript version or C sharp version, it's not like one of them is limited and offers less functions or something like that. Or well. So I was going to say there's there's two parts right there's there's the actual compute process which we wrote in .NET, mm -hmm. um, um, and it could it, it could easily be written in um, C Python also, not easily. I think there's I think it would there's some niceties about .NET about mm -hmm. getting access to all the reflection APIs mm -hmm. in in Rhino Common, but but I, th I I'm I'm pretty sure it could be done. Yeah. Um, you might not want to do that. I mean, I mean, basically, what we've got for compute, you, you just basically have to get it installed in the right spot and turn it on. Yeah. Um, then there's the other back end, which is another computer, which is probably a Linux computer. Um, this is why we use Heroku. Heroku is just some Linux computer that's running right next door to where the compute computer is running, probably in the same warehouse. Um, and on that, we were running Node.js on Heroku. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. But it's that's completely, you know, whatever language you want to use um, uh, there, it, it's completely up to you. Mm -hmm. um, I would I would recommend um, sticking with Node, C Sharp, or Python in that case, because we do provide um, uh, libraries that run outside of Rhino um, called Rhino mm -hmm. 3DM for those languages. I would... Yeah, that means yeah. you're gonna have to. I mean, so I mean, if we need to support like I don't know yeah. Ruby or Go or or, or um, Rust or something in the future, we could. Um, but um, 
those three languages are kind of JavaScript, yeah, yeah. C Sharp, and and um, Python are, are the three languages that we've so, been sticking so, with. So basically, if I was starting a completely new project and I asked you, should I use ASP.NET and Rhino compute C Sharp, or should I use Python in the back end and uh, Rhino compute with Python, you would say there is whatever you feel comfortable with. There is no limitations compute wise. Yeah, I think I think if you're using TensorFlow, you probably want to use Python. I believe that those okay. libraries, um, the client libraries to TensorFlow, are they probably exist in bo on both. That, that, that's my that's that's my problem. That's my problem because I mean not a problem because I'm very comfortable with C Sharp now and I'm slowly uh, transferring to Python. So if I had the choice, I would go with ASP.NET and so on. But then the TensorFlow is not so easily available. That's why I wanted to just make sure that. Uh, uh, that there are no limitations when it comes to compute, you know, in the, in the choice of, of, of the language itself. I mean, the, the way that I like to think about it and, and what we've really kind of, I think we've demonstrated with the app server is the easiest thing to do is to just treat compute as, as something that's, that's already been written and, and just something that you run and, and, it, and it becomes part of a, a cluster um, that that forms your entire service. So if you're if, if you have a you know a, a limitation that you need to write um, Python in order to access you know things things like TensorFlow, then then you could write a you know a, a Flask web server that does all your stuff with with TensorFlow. And then when it needs functionality from compute, you then actually call the compute server. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then get the answer back and then keep 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 doing yeah. your stuff um, rather than trying to wrap it all up into in, into, into one thing. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it it might it might be faster to have it all running together, um, but it'd be a, a lot easier to yeah. a lot easier to, to to manage and maintain. Yeah, um, well. then you then you get rid of a lot of limitations for where you can run your Python. Yeah. server and you you get to use yeah, because like Roku mean, by the time and... you get yeah by the time you get to to tensorflow whatever that object was or that data was is probably going to have to be pretty um, modified yeah. to whatever yeah you know, I TensorFlow agree. is going to need so I agree with that architecture yeah concerns separating those concerns as will mentions is you know you're going to be yeah. doing that anyways yeah I think yeah. I mean I think we, we really want to try to get away from saying compute as a web server it's really geometry as a service it's something that you would use as like a database or something like that that another application would use GAAS uh, geometry as a service <laughs> nice <laughs> okay uh, <laughs> but uh, I yeah and, and I agree I mean once when you have like a, a Python or an ASP.NET app you know, web server running somewhere. It's just, you, you can have it structured. So it calls compute. It could be calling 10 different instances yeah, of compute. Yeah. If compute goes down, it could say, hey, you know, restart, give it a kick or something like that. Yeah. It just separates mm -hmm. things out. So it's a, it, it makes yeah. it more robust and um, well, overall yeah. easier to maintain, I think. Okay. Yeah, as, as Steve said, it's, it's exactly like um, how, how you'd interact with a, with a database or something. You know, if you, you spin up a, um, a virtual machine and some database and some some cloud provider, yeah. and you'll get you know an address and some credentials to be able to access that database. And then you're in the software that you're you're writing. You'll have a client library, and you input the address and the credentials, mm -hmm. and and then you'll have a bunch of um, you know functionality you yeah, can yeah. you can use. And the whole you know actually talking to the um, the fact that you're talking to a different server is all abstracted away. So you don't really have to think about that so much in, in the code that you're writing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I mean, uh, uh, let's uh, let's move on a little bit from the uh, from the languages now. I want to talk about a little bit about uh, uh, 3JS and, and generally uh, about the subject of making a, a viewer or, or, a, or an online modeler or something like that. So maybe uh, you could give me an opinion. I guess Louis will start here. <laughs> will start here. Uh, generally about 3JS, for example, is it the best one at the moment? Like how does it compare to others like Babylon or something like that? And uh, if uh, we were to make uh, something like, a, like a, not only a viewer, but a, a bit of a modeler in, in 3D, what, what are the main limitations do you see? Like is it the speed or what, what would uh, stop us to have full-blown modeler in, 
in the browser or something like that. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of really interesting work being done and, you know, with 3D on the web and it's been going on for decades, it seems. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think the 3JS project is just generally as an open source model mm -hmm. of a project is it's it's insane. I mean, so many Agreed. contributors, so many PRs, uh, and I was drawn to it mainly because of that. Um, now, I have recently found some really interesting you know, differences between uh, let's say Babylon and, and 3JS, just when we you know wanted to even try to write a, a 3DM importer, um, a 3DM loader for one of these, mm -hmm. and you know 3JS has so many examples of, of different kinds of loaders. They even had examples for um, uh, there was a basis loader and a GLTF loader, which um, use um, WebAssembly compiled libraries um, to be able to encode and decode some of the some of the data. And so I was able to lean on those and, and, you know, they're using web workers and stuff that I was, you know, had very little experience in um, to, to get a, you know, a properly functioning 3DM loader. Um, I didn't find the same facility with, with Babylon. Um, I, I have to admit, I definitely need to take a, take a deeper dive. Mm -hmm. um, what I did find with Babylon, which was interesting is, is the, the way that you can consume it, um, and it, it's it's much more now. 3JS is kind of going through this whole process of uh, converting everything into into modules, um, and, and before JavaScript modules, and and Babylon is kind of already there, so it's much easier, let's say, to consume different parts of of Babylon uh, with Node.js or in the browser. Um, mm -hmm. So that that definitely is structured in a in a neater way in Babylon, whereas mm -hmm. 3JS is now kind of slowly making that shift. Now, taking that and making a full-blown modeler, well, that's a very different discussion. You know, with you, you don't, you know, when you're in Desktop Rhino, you have all of the the user interaction that's there. You click on something, it's selected. You know, in 3JS, you have to set up your Raycaster, and that's that's you know almost there out of the box. Yeah. Um, it's it's pretty straightforward to do so, but um, there's, you know, you can even, you know, even pretty straightforward to, to move things around. Now, going from move translating objects and, and selecting objects on a screen to doing all sorts of manipulations like we have for, I don't know, fillets or something, it's, yeah I can't imagine the, the kind of work that that would take. Yeah. Um, but again, it depends on what you actually expect people to be doing in the browser. Yeah. Um, and we've seen with you know, obviously it's possible. There's there's projects like Onshape that you know are doing amazing stuff, and it's all it's all there. So it's it's not that it's not possible. It's just you know it's it's a lot of it's a lot of work to, to remake that. Does it? The question is does it, does it make sense? Yeah. The question is does it make sense actually to, to, to have something like that? I mean, my question was more theoretical. You know, just uh, just what the limitations uh, generally generally are. For example, one of the questions that I'm that, that I'm wondering is 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 about the because I don't know that much yet, is about the JSON format itself, right? So if we, if we let's say, imagine, uh, I mean, uh, in architecture, we have these IFC files that are supposed to be these universal files to transfer between Revit and Archicad and so on, and everybody knows that doesn't work well. And because, uh, yeah, it's, uh, no, one really, no one really wants it to wo work well, except for the customers, but they, they, they are not asked. So, in theory, you know, if I want, we wanted to create our own IFC-like file that actually works, but using the JSON format, do you believe it's possible? I mean, do you believe there is something within the JSON structure that it's preventing that? Because I don't see it. I mean, no, it's just. I mean, you still need to standardize, <laughs> you know, like yeah. what the what the fields are. So it's you know, three JS has its own like internal standard, which uh, I think as a as a project that's a little shy about, you know, it's it's really kind of leaning more towards now GLTF as a the kind yeah. of uh, de facto standard for for structuring uh, data around. But the three JS internal JSON structure is is, is pretty great, anyways. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it would just be another another standard, you know. And I know that the you know Speckle project, um, which is a project that we've also supported um, about translating data around, you know, also has its own kind of a not a, not BIM stand sort of BIM stand so it kind of crosses the line it sort of straddles the line between having a, a standard and not having a standard but um I mean 
and I'm not the 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 spokesperson by any means for Speckle, although I do believe in the project. Um, yeah, I think it's it's again it's this tension between having a, a base set of objects that people can agree on are structured in this way, but also give people the facility to make you know build up build on top of that. Um, so I think they they maintain a very um, well-defined core set of objects uh, with data that can be attached to them, geometry can be attached to them, but then they give all sorts of ways for developers to, to you know, build on that and make their own objects. So um, mm -hmm. whether that can be complex, I think it can be complex enough to handle all sorts of different types mm -hmm. um, and whether this one becomes what people kind of latch on to, I don't know, I hope so. You know, but mm -hmm. there's also the buildings and habitats object model that's being, um, uh, also pushed as well as another kind of uh, standard. So these are all, and I, I know that Speckle and, and the Baham, as they call it, do play well together. But um, yeah, again, it's kind of a a battle for who's gonna who's gonna yeah be the standard. I, I think I think something to to remember with this too, though, is that three JS and Babylon are are just they're very nice libraries written on top of OpenGL or Web WebGL. Yeah, right. mm -hmm. And all they all they care about is is getting some triangles onto the GPU, right? <laughs> yeah. um, so they're not. I mean, when you talk about um, like data itself, that you know they don't care about you know area and, and weight and yeah, actually, you know, that was one of my questions. Price yeah. or whatever you want to associate with an object, right? So like um, that's that's a. I think you use three in Babylon as your as your as a runtime viewer for your data, but I, I think you would keep your data in a different format. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That was actually one of my questions because in in in, in the BIM world we deal with this a lot of metadata, you know. So on top of geometry, we have we have a, a ton of information. So uh, so we would have to create uh, our own objects, and uh, and uh, it's of course it's very important because. Uh, the collaboration is moving online, right? All the 3D viewers for architectural objects are moving online. So a lot of markup has to be done online. A lot of, uh, not, not modeling, but manipulation of the model, filtering and so on and so on. So we have to be able to load that metadata on uh, and load the BIM files onto the cloud. And uh, I don't know if you have any uh, thoughts about that, if that's problematic or if you think we will achieve that or not. But... Well, I mean, I, I guess I can speak in the respect of like what we've done. Um, I mean, we're, we're definitely not BIM, right? But I mean, we do support um, being able to read 3DM files in, in the browser. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's the 3, 3DM. So with the 3DM loader, right, that you wrote, that's, I don't have to do anything, right? I, it translates everything immediately from 3DM, right? Send us your file so we can make sure that. I mean, right. does a you send good us job. send us bugs and issues for GitHub, yeah. but, but, but again, that's that's just converting the 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 data in the 3DM file to 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 triangles that are just going to yeah. end up on your screen. Like, I mean, there's 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 still a lot of data that's embedded in the 3DM uh, file that you you could have there that um, the 3DM loader doesn't care about and, and shouldn't. And how does? How does 3GS communicate with NURBS? It's is it only meshes or uh, and curves? Is it only uh, discretized polylines at the end, or is there any way to actually uh, load in NURBS geometry into? A... That's pretty much how GPUs work. They they don't they don't know about curves. Mm -hmm. So um, you you have to do tessellation. Um, it it you know you, you're gonna have either meshes or on the GPU you can actually do. Uh, tessellation. Um, it's pretty hard with WebGL. Uh, desktop GL, you can do that. Mm -hmm. But um, but yeah, it, 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 you, you know, GPUs are really structured for, for, you know, getting triangles and then figuring out how to fill in between mm -hmm. points. Mm -hmm. yeah. This yeah. is to see it. I mean, yes, you can still find the tangent of a NURBS curve um, with, mm -hmm. but yeah, to, to see, to actually preview yeah. the geometry, yeah. yeah, we have to discretize it all. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what my, my, my question, I mean, when you, uh, when you translate your translate, I don't know, points to points, lines to lines, but then surfaces to meshes, right? And then curves to, I don't know, polylines or something like that, or however it works. You know, that all that code is there. There's also the, 
-hmm. in the 3DM loader and the 3JS uh, library. But, you know, Steve also has been working on this RView project, which mm -hmm. a lot of the code for translating geometry and eventually viewing it is also there. So you can kind of see the, the different processes. Um, yeah, and then yeah, there, I, there I, I, I don't even convert lines to lines. I'm converting lines to triangles because <laughs> you have to because WebGL doesn't support uh, lines wider than one pixel. Oh, really? On certain uh, operating systems. Let me, uh -huh. let me say that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so you, if you want thick lines, they're basically rectangles. You got to make rectangles. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess the point, the point I, I'm, I'm trying to say is that the, the Rhino 3 game library, which we do make available, um, does give you that in, the information about the nerves, the, yeah. the, the yeah. issues, yeah, yeah. and you want to visualize them. Yeah, of course, of course, especially do calculations and intersections and so on and so on, which is the most important part. Yeah, I, I think I think that actually was kind of the big breakthrough that kind of started all this compute stuff was that we could compile this C++ code that we have for for what goes into a 3DM file um, yeah. to WebAssembly and have that called in JavaScript. And that, at that point, we were like, well, crap, you know, let's call web servers and 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 take 3DM files and, and mm -hmm. you know, pull the data out and, and sh display them or, 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 you know, as you said, like, you know, get, get information off of classes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, because you're much more experienced in, in development than, than I am, just uh, your, your thoughts on this uh, 3JS and the development of visualization in the web. I mean, I'm very interested in visualization. We are also using Unreal Engine to, cre to create simulations. Uh, we are, I have like a, side startup where we actually do that and uh i would do they have web do they have web stuff too in real engine i'm just not yeah familiar. that's that's uh, i mean uh we want to move to the web uh, eventually so unreal was actually using some kind of web assembly like m script and translation they were using it but as far as i know last year or two years ago they just abandoned it left it to the to the public to try to manage that and they kind of moved to streaming so they had they call this uh, pixel streaming right that's how they, they call it so um because you can make prettier pictures that's for sure <laughs> yeah. so that's, that's my question about what, what do you think about it i mean do you do you think uh, streaming being the main direction in the future or do you think uh, that we can somehow bring a lot of realism on on the on the front end because of, of course we are very limited and Maybe in 3JS we can have baked textures already, which with, with shadows in them, which can make it pretty real. And I, but I don't know how much we can push that, or is actually that going to be abandoned and we're going to go to streaming? <laughs> when it, when it, when it comes to realism, of course. I mean, I'm not talking about. Uh... Yeah, I mean, I, I, recently um, there was this code. Inktober, I think it was called Inktober, and I was following some some people doing some things with 3ds, which are just beautiful, non-photorealistic stuff. You know, like really sketchy stuff, and some of the most beautiful stuff yeah. I've seen and yeah. done in, in in the web. But yeah, there you're going to be limited with how many triangles you can actually push to this thing, how many lights you have uh, mm -hmm. to be able to show this. So yeah, you're going to have to do all the the classic tricks that you would do on desktops, you know, 10, 20 years ago, uh, bake everything, um, simplify things, merge faces, et cetera, um, where with pixel streaming, I mean, you know, it's, it's, yeah. it's uh, uh, the Unreal Engine 5 demos that were shown are just crazy. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many billions of triangles they were showing. So yeah, yeah. you could eventually forward that experience to somebody yeah. you know experiencing it through a through a browser or wherever that yeah. pixel stream eventually ends up i don't know i mean i still think that there's a lot you can get out of uh the experience of visualizing on the web and especially the probably the facility of getting it there in mm -hmm. a shorter amount of time this is maybe just a, mm -hmm. an opinion but um yeah i i, I, think I don't... it's gonna be the divide of how much do you want to push how many yeah, I'm not sure if we're there with the streaming technology-wise. I mean, we did some tests, and from time to time, it's lags. It's it, I don't think, or internet-wise, or broadband-wise, I don't think we're we're there yet to for it to work on a global scale. You know, may, maybe maybe in the future. That's why that's why, how how I feel about it. I mean, it's it seems very cool. It seems ideal. Although it, there is trouble of setting up a server or there are costs if you set it up on a, an external server that are huge, but uh, it's, it's a nice way to go. But I, of course, I wouldn't abandon the, 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 fr the front end one and we were basically definitely going in this direction. 
and I, I have a question that might sound um, a little bit abstract and I think the speckle guys are going in this direction but uh, we especially in architecture we're using uh, used uh, uh, used to working with files you know so uh, and that's sometimes ridiculous you know you need 15 minutes to open a Revit file and then maybe you also only need to rename a window and then close it you know so do you see us when we move to the cloud of not working with files anymore but working with objects like uh, somehow uh, seeing a house not as a one whole thing but it's just a group of different objects then you can easily then filter and, and do whatever you want with them because I guess the web the cloud doesn't have to deal with files I mean did you have some experience with that or those thoughts or yeah I mean I think it's I think we're absolutely in a moment where we need to move beyond uh, beyond files and I think now we're at the in interchanging data you know interoperability with data as a speckle is, is is pushing and, and not just speckle but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of different uh, formats are coming online but I think now soon we're going to go beyond this we're going to go to interchanging and collaborating with processes and eventually collaborating with pipelines like for example um, you know there's Hypar I don't know if you know the uh, Hypar project um, which is I think it's Hypar oh, actually yeah I saw it yeah, or yeah. Hypar.io yeah, so yeah. they're um, what they're setting up is is um, yes, you're exchanging data, but more than that, you're creating your own sort of uh, functions. And these functions you can uh, sort of string together into a collection of, you know, I don't know what they call it, a, um, a work set or something. I, I can't remember the, the terminology, but it's a, it's a grouping of functions. And this you can share now. So it's not just, so you have the data that's passing through those functions, you have the functions themselves, and you have the collection of functions. And I think mm -hmm. we're not there as a, as, as it's not. Uh, it's very early days, I think, for that kind of uh, collaboration. Uh, but I think also Ladybug Tools um, folks are are doing that with a pollination cloud. So you might have a, a recipe, a recipe for a particular kind of uh, daylight analysis or okay. thermal comfort analysis that maybe your your office puts together, and that's mm -hmm. your kind of like secret sauce. And you can make that available as a as a process, mm -hmm. um, passing through the Ladybug. Um, or honeybee data mm -hmm. file that they're now kind of developing their own standard. Um, and I think we're going to, I think now we're, we're getting somewhere where the data interoperability and maturity is there, where we can kind of eventually leave files behind to some extent. Um, but I think then, you know, five, 10 years from now, we're going to be looking at, you know, interchanging uh, processes mm -hmm. and Great. collections yeah. of processes. Yeah. 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 I agree. And uh, <laughs> this might be a little bit beside the point, but you also mentioned WebAssembly before, and I, I know generally what it is, but I, I thought maybe as, as fellow senior developers, you can uh, in, enlighten me a little bit like uh, and about the uh, significance of WebAssembly. I mean, I know it generally takes the C++ code and translates it to JavaScript so that it, it can run on a browser, right? But is there like a bigger significance in the context? I mean... Uh, is the, is the compute JS package make that way or with WebAssembly or no? Just Rhino 3DM, and I guess Steve can probably speak to this a little, you know, a little mm -hmm. bit more in detail. But I mean, Open NURBS, um, which is now what we're calling kind of Rhino 3DM, is twenty some years old now. I don't I don't know exactly yeah. how old it is. Mm -hmm. And when it was developed, there was no concept of getting this necessarily to run on mm -hmm. the web, but uh, WebAssembly is, is enabled, and with the Enscripten project, has enabled this 20-year-old uh, code base, uh, which has always been open source, uh, to be compiled in a way that then is consumable by in, in a different format. You know, mm -hmm. it's usable on the web. I don't know if Steve, you want to detail that a little bit more, but I think that already that's that's really interesting. Yeah. A really interesting promise from from, from such yeah, a that's, technology. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 kind of the key to everything mm -hmm. <laughs> really is that Rhino 3DM WebAssembly. I mean, WebAssembly is still pretty raw. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're at minimum viable products still. Oh, okay. And there are issues that we, we need to deal with with WebAssembly. Um, mm -hmm. I think the most important one is there's really no garbage collector. Okay. And so you got to be careful mm -hmm. or you'll just, you'll just blow up your memory on um, when you're running in something like Chrome. Okay. Um, but but yeah, I mean, basically what Rhino 3DM is, is, is yeah, you, you, we're taking the, the open herbs code, which yeah, it's 20 years old, but we've been working on it for 20 years since, you know, I mean, we, we work on it all the time. Um, 
and and also peppering it with with a with a st- syntactic style of Rhino Common. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to make everything look and feel the same. So when you jump from C Sharp, where you've used Rhino Common before, mm-hmm. into Rhino 3DM, and you're in JavaScript and you're flailing about because it's the first time you've used JavaScript, at least things look the same from from the perspective of using the Rhino library. So, um, you know, you'll you have classes called mesh and brep you mm-hmm. know and sub d and, and, and yeah. curve and they have the same the same same hierarchy and the same function names mm-hmm. um and and the cool thing is, is is all that crap was running right inside of chrome or 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 edge or or uh firefox firefox <laughs> yeah <Opera>. yeah they're, <laughs> that's cool. yeah. um and, and and they're all and all these guys are, are supporting WebAssembly now mm-hmm. it's not yeah. just like this weird exotic technology that um, only a few browsers uh, support mm-hmm. across the board web assemblies being being um, supported and also uh, and that includes on your phones okay um, okay so it, great it's pretty cool yeah okay so to wrap it up slowly and uh, have my late dinner <laughs> uh, i wanted to ask you uh, first of all to maybe to give some general pointers to me or to anyone listening that wants to start using rhino compute just uh, what they can do, do where they can they can go, or just I mean, we just heard that some new videos are coming up, and uh, after that, I mean, if you have any questions for me or something like that, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm, I'm glad to answer them. Well, I think I mean the best spot to start is with the videos. Um, I know mine's around here somewhere, so you already saw it. You know where the link is. And- you can you can send me the links and I can put them in the description of the YouTube video that's or something like that also. I know I know most of them, but if, if there is anything new, yeah. Yeah, and and, and Will Will and, and Luis did kind of a, a, a B2 of that presentation, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. We we kind of learned, we said, oh, it'd be nice to have some improved caching, um, make it a little easier to set up the web server. Um, I don't know if we got to the Git request stuff yet, but um, um we're pretty close yeah um i can't think, remember i think we did do something with that but um but th- those videos are those videos are good to watch yeah um because it there that's a that's a specific use case that we hear people want quite a bit is they've they've set up a a, a grasshopper custom grasshopper definition and they want to have a web page where they can um have some controls and, and see see different outcomes from changing the yeah. controls basically a remote control on your on your web browser yeah yeah um mm-hmm. there's that's that's bit. where the the get requests was was done i just remembered now was the um automatically generating uh web i'm 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 maybe promising a little bit too much now but um <laughs> automatically gener- um, generating the 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 interface um mm-hmm. for a given yes. grasshopper definition that was a kind of a little um uh, sort of a, a little internal hackathon we did while supporting the guys working on the actual hackathon um, yeah. at AAC Tech a couple of uh, couple of weekends ago. Um, yeah, every time we do oh, these yeah. things, we, we get stressed out. We, we work for months getting these presentations put together. And then right after the presentation's done, we're all unwinding and hackathons are going on and, and, and something cool comes out of it. And right at that time, Will made this um, addition to the app server where you could basically just... Um, have an auto-generated web page for your uh, grasshopper definition. It's pretty cool. Yeah, sounds cool. Um, <laughs> just, yeah. just, just a kind of prototype. But, but that's what like so much of like so so much of this stuff is really is um, it's like getting it to a certain stage to give people an idea of what to do, and then sometimes with things like the app server, it actually ends up going a little bit beyond that. That some people can then just take it and use it mm-hmm. and some people can take it and build on top of it and create something new and some people will look at it and then say oh, okay i like what that does but i want to write it in python yeah, yeah. and then do their own thing and, and we um, want to try to make it clear that is. we want to make it clear that like this is not all that you can do with compute basically you know this this is a this is a, a really cool use case mm-hmm. and we want to try to build this out to, to be, you know, be this great use case that people, I can, I can imagine a lot of people would want to use this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you have, you have, you basically have, you know, one to N number 
is running for you and you have the full API access to Rhino Common um, that you can build plugins and have them running on your, on your Rhino too and, and have whatever geometry computations that Rhino supports being done for you on another computer yeah. or computers. Yeah. Now with sub D. Now with sub D. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> Ding. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and, and, and we're still working on this stuff. I mean, there, there's, there's so many cool avenues um, that you can go with it. Like even on the app server stuff I've been working on lately, um, one of my pet projects I really want to get is not using a web page at all for the app server, but actually calling the app server from inside Grasshopper okay. as another component because that's basically what we, what we would call remote definitions. Mm -hmm. um, and then you could actually take advantage of all the caching and, and, and whatnot that an app server is doing. And also you could start chaining definitions together and have different, right. different parties working on different definitions at the same time. Um, and I mean, and all, it, all that is, is, is basically getting a component put together that does the right thing and calls app server. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. Sounds very cool. And very exciting. I can't get, can't wait to start uh, diving into a, a little bit deeper, which which I am doing at the moment. So I hope we will have uh, more conversations like this, and then one of the next times maybe we can even uh, dwell into the uh, look into the code a little bit and even make some tutorials and so on. I think that would be great. But for now, I think this was really really great overview. I mean, it for at least it it helped me to understand things better and uh, to know uh, how to start or to be secure that if I start in one way, I won't make a mistake. And it was very, very nice meeting you all in uh, person, not only over the avatar in the forum. <laughs> and uh, I, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, let's do it again. I think uh, if, you, if you get into it, um, I mean, all this stuff is open source too, so we can kind of dig through you yep. can dig into the nitty-gritty details on anything if you want um, on another meeting. Thanks a lot. Yeah, just give it time to fix all our typos first. <laughs> well, it's open source. We let him do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Sounds good. Okay, all right. Have a nice day, guys, and uh, right. talk to you soon. Thank you. Thanks right. a lot.